Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh, I say that for a couple of reasons. One is, this church has been very, very faithful through the years at supporting Kingswood. Many of you have been on our vision tours. Uh, we have one, Bob Strong, who has been on our board for years and years and just does a great job in his role there. So it's great to be back. I wanted to make sure I got to the church to say thank you uh, from up here, how much I appreciate that. Churches are the backbone of what we do and the reason why we do what we do. But there's another reason why I'm glad I'm here, and that is because I'm a hometown boy. I was born not far from here. I think it was Upper Darby. The details are a little hazy, but, uh, but that's what they tell me anyway. And I grew up not far from here in Willow Grove, so my early years were spent stomping around uh, in our neck of the woods here. And I live in Canada now, but I haven't forgot my roots. I live in Canada because that's where Kingswood is, New Brunswick, not New Brunswick, New Jersey, New Brunswick, Canada. You just go up to Maine and turn right. <laughs> How many of you have been on our campus? Can I just see your hands? Well, we love, thank you so much for coming, and we'd love to have more of you come. We do what's called a vision tour every year. Give people an opportunity just to get to know Kingswood a little bit better and to meet our students. If you meet our students, you will fall in love with our students. So this coming September, we're going to take a, a fall foliage cruise. It leaves from Boston, hits Maine, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, back to Maine, then back to Boston. So I've got details out on the back. Uh, if you're not sure about that, just take, take one of the brochures and give us a call. We'll answer your questions. But we'd love to have you get to know us better. So. If you're interested in more of what we do, we've got one of these brochures in the back that tells you a little bit about Kingswood, gives you some sense of what we do. We're a Bible college, which means that all of our programs are designed to help people prepare to serve the Lord in ministry. So that could be the kind of ministry that Pastor Palmer does, could be the kind of ministry that you may do through your vocation. Palmer, accountant, nurse, whatever you might be, you can do ministry through that. Kingswood is a great place to prepare for that. Now, I say that for lots of reasons. One is, I'm looking out at people for whom Kingswood may be the perfect choice for you when you consider Christian higher education. But I also recognize that in this room are some influencers. I was speaking at a church not too long ago, about a year and a half ago, and I shared my message, and I went back out to the table like I'm going to do in a few minutes, and a grandmother came rushing out to me. She said, my grandson needs to come to your school. I said, great, give me his number, I'll call him. So I called him on the way home and began a, a conversation. Anyway, Zeke is a student at our school now because of that influencer. So you may know of people, grandchildren, neighbors, children, niece, nephew, whoever, for whom the idea of spending two or four years at a, at a spiritually formative, ministry-focused school might be the perfect thing for the next chapter of their lives. We have a gap year program for those who aren't quite sure what the after high school years look like. So anyway, just check out what we have to offer. We'd love to talk with you about that. Now, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 15, because that's where we're going to be this morning. Romans chapter 15, and I want to look with you at verses 1 through 13. I was reading this passage uh, a little while ago, and I was arrested by two words, and I felt like these two words are the two words I need to talk about. So here we go, Romans 15, verse 1. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant to the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises 
made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. And then Paul quotes from the Old Testament, a series, four of them, passages from the Old Testament, which are promises of the Messiah's coming and redeeming not only Jews, but Gentiles. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again, it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. And then Paul concludes this passage with verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. I pray that by your spirit you would make it come alive to us this morning. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. What are the two words? Did you get them? Endurance and encouragement. Now, aren't those the two perfect words for us as Christians? Endurance. There's not a one of us who tries to live the Christian life and doesn't find himself or herself facing some strong headwinds. You, you try to do the right thing, people don't always understand. You try to be faithful, people criticize you. You try to live the Christian life and circumstances arise over which you have no control. And you almost get the sense of God, really? Is this what it means to follow you? And in fact, this is what it means to follow you. Perseverance. This is why perseverance is so essential in living the Christian life. We must endure. But not just endure. It's not that God wants us to, to just grit our teeth and just get through the day. And this is where that other word is so helpful. It's endurance and encouragement. It's perseverance, but with joy. It is hope, as the verse reminds us. It is what you might call unshakable joy. And wouldn't you love a little unshakable joy right now? Mm -hmm. The kind of joy that allows you to see God's hand at work, even in the difficult circumstances of your life. The kind of joy that allowed you to press forward and do the right thing even when people didn't understand. The kind of joy that allowed you to smile even when you hear news that would ordinarily cause you to collapse. I mean, which of us doesn't want unshakable joy? If, if I had a bowl up here filled with a pill that could give you unshakable joy, can I just see the hands? How many of you would line up for that pill? Can I just see your hands? Yeah, just about everybody, except for a few people who don't raise their hands, no matter what the pastor asks them to do. It's a matter of principle. I'm one of those people. So, would you just raise your hand inside? It's an unshakable joy, but wouldn't you love to have it? So that's my question. Where does this unshakable joy come from? And as I read that passage, did you notice where it comes from? Look at verse 3. It comes from the scriptures. Somehow, by exposure to the word of God, God gives to us unshakable joy, what we all admit we need. Well, naturally, the question is how? How is it that we go from reading, studying, memorizing, meditating on the scriptures to come to unshakable joy? How do the scriptures produce unshakable joy? That's the question I want us to think about this morning. And I'm going to suggest there are five ways that God gives us unshakable joy through the scriptures. And for each of them, I'm going to just give you a picture to hold in your mind to help you remember. You ready to go? You taking notes? This might be a good one to take notes on. I'm going to give you five things. Here's the first. How does God give us unshakable joy through the scriptures? And I'm going to suggest that the first way is through the promises contained in Scripture. The Apostle Peter, in his second letter, describes the Bible as filled with great and precious promises. The Bible is filled with these promises. How many? I don't know. I read one website that said 3,573. 
There was another website that said 5,000, another website that said 10,000. I don't know how many promises there are. I know there's at least four, because that was what was in our passage today. You want to count with me? All right, let's start with what we could call the general promises. These are promises we find in Scripture. They are made to everyone in all times, under any circumstances. John 3.16 may be the most familiar. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's a general promise. That is a promise for every single person, no matter who they are, where they are, when they are, the circumstances in which they find themselves. It's a general promise. So we're going to count all the general promises. Well, then we come to a second category of promises. These are specific promises. These are promises made to specific people under specific circumstances at a specific time. And there are lots of these. Like the promise that God made to Abram and Sarah that they would have a son in their old age. That's a specific promise. We were standing in the back getting ready to set up. I won't embarrass them by saying who it was. But somebody came up the stairs, looked at Eileen and me, and said, Well, is it a boy or a girl? I got to tell you, that would not be good news. God made that promise to Abram and Sarah that they have a son in their old age. And there's a reason for that. And it was good news to them. It would not be good news to me. I raised my kids. They're out of the house. I don't want them coming back in to live in the basement or anywhere else in my house. So no thank you. I do not want to claim that specific promise. And should I? And this is a question people ask. The Bible is filled with these specific promises. I know the plans I have for you, plans to promise. Should I claim that promise? Should we count that in the list of promises? You ever ask yourself that question? Mm -hmm. yeah. Here's what I want you to do. Just set that aside. Set that question aside for the moment. Let's not count all the specific promises. There's a ton of them. But let's just set it aside. I'll come back to those. So we've got all the general promises. <coughs> I'm going to suggest something you probably didn't think of as a promise. All the commands of Scripture are promises. Think about it. All the commands of Scripture. Can you think of any commands in Scripture? Be holy as your Heavenly Father is holy. Be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. That's a, that's a command. That's also a promise. All the commands of Scripture are promises. You say, Steve, how is that? Well, if it's a command that comes from a loving and good God, then there must also be, along with that command, the resources that will enable you to obey that command. Does that make sense? So if you tell your son or your daughter to go out and shovel snow in the driveway, knowing that they don't have the physical capacity to do it, they don't even have a snow shovel, you wouldn't be much of a parent, would you? Well, God's certainly a better parent than we are. We wouldn't ask our children to do something we knew they were incapable of doing that we weren't going to resource them to do. And God is a better parent than we are. If he, com listen to me, if he commands us to do something, he is a good God and will provide whatever resources we need in order to obey that command. This is why commands are sometimes called veiled promises, because they don't look like promises on the surface, but every command of Scripture, and there are tons of them, are also promises. How many you got in your list? So let me give you another category, a fourth category of, of what are really promises that you may not have thought of as promises. We've talked about the general promises. We've talked about the specific promises. I said set those aside. We'll come back to them. We talked about the commands. Here's a fourth category. Every statement that you find in Scripture which describes God's nature is a promise. In Sunday school this morning, we were talking about asking the question, very important question of your Bible study. What does this tell me about God's character? Every answer that you get to that question, what you learn about the character of God, is a promise. You say, why? Because God, by nature, doesn't change. He's perfect, and so changing is not an option. If he changed to anything from perfect, it would be less than perfect. Not an option. 
So because God is perfect, he does not change, which means that every statement you find in Scripture that describes a characteristic of God, his love, his patience, his jealousy, all of those statements are always true. You can count on it. Take them as a promise. This, by the way, is what we do with the specific promise. Think of it this way. God wrote Abram and Sarah a check. And, and on the check, it said, payable to the order of Abram and Sarah, one son. Signed, God. I don't believe God has a check like that for me. But here's what I do believe. Here's the promise in that. God has a check for me. And just as Abram and Sarah needed that son in order to serve God's purposes and accomplish God's plan, God knows what you and I need to accomplish his purposes. He knows exactly what we need. He knows what we need moment by moment to accomplish our purposes. And so he writes us a check. I don't mean literally. This isn't the prosperity gospel. This is the gospel. He has a check written out for you. His mercies are new every morning. He knows exactly what you will need to do to be faithful today. And he provides that for you. He writes out that check. He writes it out payable to you. Payable to you. Whatever you need today. Signed, God. That is a promise. It's waiting. The amount may be different. From anybody else's. But the account is the same. The signature on the bottom is the same. God has made a promise to provide all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. That's a promise. Can you see why this brings unshakable joy? What circumstance could you find yourself in where you would lack what you need to flourish and find hope? None. This is where unshakable joy comes from. Not just the checks, but the one who signs the checks. Not just the promises, but the promise-making God. That's the God we need in Scripture. And this is why an exposure to Scripture, a drinking in of these great and precious promises, is such a source of unshakable joy. Do you know the promises God has for you? Are you claiming the promises God has? Maybe, like me, you grew up in a home with one of those plastic promise boxes. Can I see the hands of the people? A little loaf of bread with the promises in the back. You can still buy that from Amazon. It's like $8.75 or something. You can still buy just a little plastic box with, with cards in the back. And there were promises on those cards. That's what scripture is. It's a promise box. So the first way that God provides unshakable joy for us through scripture is he gives us a promise box. It's filled with great and precious promises. And we can draw from those and find hope. Here's the second. God gives us, through Scripture, gentle correction. I was pastoring in the district up in the Poconos, Pine Grove area, in my first church. And I was doing everything that I thought a pastor should do. I mean, I was scurrying around, visiting people, going to the hospital, preparing sermons, chairing board. I was doing everything. And I was studying one morning in my, in my study, in Luke 10, I was studying my way through Luke, and I got to Luke 10, and I remember hearing, as distinctly as you're hearing my voice, I remember God saying to me, when I got to the story of Mary and Martha, remember the story? Where Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet. Well, what's Martha doing? Working. She's working. She's scurrying around. She's being the perfect hostess. And she complains to Jesus. That are sisters who are nothing but sitting at Jesus' feet and listening and soaking it all in. And I, I, I promise you, I distinctly heard God say to me, Steve, you are just like Martha. Rushing around, getting things good for God, but not sitting at his feet and listening to him. And Jesus convicted me at that moment. That I was not being the kind of pastor I needed to be. I was doing all the pastoral things, but I wasn't listening to God. And that's what my people needed me to do. 
And there was this, from the word, this gentle correction. I won't put any of the kids in the room on the spot, but the question they're probably asking themselves is, okay, you're talking about unshakable joy? I've been corrected by my parents. It doesn't feel like that gives me much joy when I get corrected or disciplined, right? No. So in what sense is Scripture's gentle correction a source of unshakable joy? Anybody ever been to Yellowstone National Park? A few of us. Yellowstone is built on a lot of volcanic activity, a lot of hot springs in the area. And uh, the Parks Department has a problem because these springs, they're a beautiful, beautiful shade of blue, like this beautiful aqua blue, and they're just so enticing. I mean, you want to, I remember as a kid going there and looking at these things from a distance and wanting just in the worst way to do what? Jump Run over and look in. But of course, you know what would happen if you did that. You get to the edge, it's just uh, calcium and other minerals that have uh, that have deposited there and dried up. It's just a thin, it's like thin ice. And anybody who's gone over to the edge has gone in. They're like, soup. <laughs> and so the Parks Department said, we've got these beautiful hot pools that are fatal, but we want to get people as close as they can get to them without falling in. And so what did they do? They built wooden walkways, boardwalks. And if you stay on that boardwalk, you can experience all you want to experience of that hot spring safely. This is what Scripture does. God builds those walkways through Scripture, tells us how to live, what to avoid, what to pursue. Not because He wants to take away our joy, but because He wants to give us our joy. If you stay on the walkways of Scripture, you will experience all the joy this world can offer. The psalmist talks in Psalm 119 about running in freedom. This is what Scripture lets you do. Scripture tells you ahead of time what will win and what will lose, what will gain for you and what you will pay for in the end. Scripture tells you that. Gives you the hint ahead of time. Do you live by Scripture? This lamp to our feet, this light to our path, we find the path through this life that is the path of greatest joy. This is how Scripture gives us unshakable joy through gentle correction. Steers us back on the path. Helps us to live in freedom. This is why, here's the second picture. This is why Scripture, when I think of Scripture, I think of Scripture as a note from your mother. You ever get a note from your mother? Or your father or your mentor, whoever it might be, that can speak that word of truth into your life like no one else can do. And they can say some hard things to you, but you can take it because you know why. They love you. They only mean this for your best. This is what Scripture does. It's God's love letter to you to help you to live in unshakable joy. So we've got a promise box, and we've got a note from our mother. What's the third thing? Well, it's an alarm clock. Scripture's like an alarm clock. Here's why we need an alarm clock. Because you and I, 24-7, 365 days, are being lulled to sleep. Doesn't matter whether you're politically left or politically right. Doesn't matter what your politics, what your socioeconomic status. You and I live in an environment all day, every day, where we are being presented with one version of reality. We'll start with the question of identity, just as an example. Who are you? How do you identify yourself? Well, I'm so-and-so's mom. I'm so-and-so's granddad. I'm the executive of a... I live at... I drive a... I can do... I have a degree from... That's how we identify ourselves. What are the two most important questions that are asked of you when you meet a new person? What's your name and what do you do for a living? Because that's who you are. According to this one version of reality. Now, I'm not saying that's entirely bad. Those are aspects of your identity, but that's not the most important aspect of your identity. And that's where Scripture comes in. Scripture is an alarm clock that wakes us up so that we can remember what's really true. Who are you? You're a child of God. 
Why does that matter? Well, because if you drive up and that's who you are, what happens when that breaks down? If you live at and it burns down. If you work at and it means a layoff. If you can do, that's who you are. You can do and you can't do it. <coughs> if you're a mom, if you're a grandfather, if your identity is tied up in your family, what happens when that, that family moves away or turns on you or betrays you or is alienated from you? It happens to Christians. It happens. Who are you then? See, if our identity is tied up in anything else, we can lose that identity and then we don't know who we are. But if our identity is in our being a child of God, that will not change. God's love for you will never change. It will never deviate. You will always be loved by God. That's what Scripture says. You see how this alarm clock works? We can do the same thing with what gives you meaning, purpose in life. Why do you do what you do? How do you know what's right and wrong? What's your destiny? All these questions, the world has one version of reality and Scripture has another. And you and I need Scripture to wake us up. So we know what's true. You ever, you ever hit a golf ball just right? Me neither. But, but I've been told that there's a certain feeling when that club hits that ball. There's just a certain feeling that you're right. You ever been swimming in water that you thought you knew how deep it was? But at that moment when you went to touch bottom, you couldn't touch bottom. You remember that feeling? Now, remember the feeling when you finally could touch bottom. That's what scripture says. Orange. Anchor sheet with what's really true. And once you know what's really true, you know how to live in this world. This is what Scripture does for us. And so Scripture is like an alarm clock. Like a promise box, a note from your mother, an alarm clock. Here's the fourth. Scripture is like a picture book. Now, you never outgrow picture books. When you're a kid, you read picture books. When you're older, you have YouTube. It's the same idea. You want to know how to do something? You look on YouTube. Because... If you can see a picture of it, it's just easier to get. This is what Scripture does for us. It's filled with these pictures of unshakable joy. So you and I know what unshakable joy is supposed to look like. So God, he could say to us, go out and face your giants. And he does say that. But he also paints this picture of little David with his sling and his stones. Heading out to face Goliath. And when you see that picture of David and Goliath, you've got a picture of what unshakable joy looks like in gigantic circumstances. And he could say to you, trust me, I will provide exactly what you need. And he does say that. But he also gives us this picture of Abram and Sarah, who had been promised something and then wait decades to get it. He could say to you, give up what's dearest to you in faith. And he does say that. But he also paints a picture of Abram leading Isaac up Mount Moriah. See, when you see a picture of something, it just allows you to understand it in a way that you can get it. This is why the writer of Hebrews said, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, it's the same Greek word as our text, endured the cross, despising it's shame. Seeing the picture of Jesus gives us unshakable joy. And so it's like a picture book. But, but we need to remember that God's purpose in showing us Jesus is not just to give us an example of unshakable joy. I mean, that would be great. We'd come in, we'd look at the cross, and we'd say, oh, I see what unshakable joy looks like. I'll go out and try to do that. That's great, but there's more. Jesus didn't come just to illustrate unshakable joy. He came to produce it. If you're still in Romans, turn back to Romans 5. In Romans 5, Paul tells us what it means to experience this relationship that Jesus makes possible. Listen to what he says. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace 
with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom He has given to us. Jesus came so that you could be made right with God. And once you are made right with God, the Holy Spirit produces unshakable joy from within you. It isn't just a matter of you and I manufacturing joy in our circumstances. It's a matter of allowing the Holy Spirit of God to let an unshakable joy factory be built in your lives. Listen to verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Scripture is what teaches us that we need salvation. Scripture is what shows us where salvation comes from. Scripture is what tells us about the Holy Spirit. Scripture is what allows that Holy Spirit unshakable joy factory to flourish within you. Scripture is like your like your owner's manual for your car. The better you know that owner's manual, the more you'll get out of that vehicle. Like a promise car. Like a note from your mom. <coughs> like an alarm clock. It's like a picture book. It's like your owner's manual. That's what Scripture is. In producing unshakable joy. Here's my question. If Scripture is a source of unshakable joy, and we have admitted that unshakable joy is what we would love to have, why is it that in the typical congregation, out of ten people in that congregation, only two of us are reading our Bibles every day? And two of us aren't reading it at all. You say, I knew it was coming. It's going to lay a guilt trip on us. No, I'm not. You knew me, you know guilt is the furthest thing in my mind at this moment. Welcome to Walgreens. I said if I had a bowl with a pill, you'd want it. If it could give you unshakable joy. Welcome to Walgreens. Here it is. This is what we need. Three quick things, and then I'm done. First. My prayer for you is that you be a family of the Word. Your kids are still in the home. Make the Word a regular part of their lives. Talk to them about it. Teach them how to study it and learn it and memorize it. If you're a grandparent, you can still do it. You can buy a Bible they can understand. You can coach them on it. You can bribe them in ways that parents can't to memorize it. Just make sure your family is in the Word. You bring up a child the way that child should go, and you've given them something they can hold on to for the rest of their lives. Here's the second thing. Be a church of the Lord. I don't know much about your church. I do know that in all likelihood, you already are a church of the Lord. <coughs> but here's my prayer. That if anybody in this area came to the realization that they needed to know more of Scripture, they would know the church they should go to. Here's my third request. Would you pray for Kingswood? We are a Bible college. Everybody majors in Bible. Because we want to produce graduates who go out with that bowl of unshakable joy built. I don't think the enemy is too crazy about that. Would you pray for us? We can do the ministry God's given to us. Today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Most of all. And we thank you for your spirit who teaches it to us. And we ask, Father, that you would help us to be people of the Lord, in a church of the Lord, praying for those who are preparing to go out and minister the Word. Because we need that joy. And you, like you always do, give us just what we need. In Jesus' name.